Well, good morning. Thanks. Thanks for leading us in worship. It's fun to have the hymn books out, isn't it? It's actually fun to be able to see the notes and know what you're singing rather than guessing all the time. So, and it was fun to actually sing a new uh, Christmas carol. I mean, it's not new, but I've never sung it before, so that was actually kind of fun. And speaking of new, I don't know if you guys saw the, the email this week, but we actually, we at EBC have two new deacons who are part of us last Sunday night in our church meeting. Uh, David Nykirk and Jared Holloway were voted in as deacons of our church, so, uh, yeah. Well, Merry Christmas. Uh, as, as most of you know, the, you know, we call Christmas Advent season. Um, and Advent, really, it means arrival. Right? And so uh, if, you, if, if it means arrival, then what is implied with that is that there's something that you're waiting for to get to you. You're waiting for something to come, to arrive. And one of the best parts, in my opinion, of the Christmas season is that sense of anticipation. Um, think about it from your own childhood, or, or maybe think about it from the perspective of your kids or grandkids. But much of the joy of Christmas itself is that hopefulness of what's to come. I mean, my kids spent weeks, and you know, I did this when I was little, I'm sure a lot of you did too, but they spent weeks pulling out the catalogs out of the newspaper and other things that would come in the mail and going through all the pages and circling everything that they want meaning they circled everything in the catalog, and they all put their little initials by who wanted which item, and they were hoping and waiting to get that. Actually, I was in the car on the way here, and my six-year-old Rachel said to me, she's like, Dad, I don't know why we did that, because you never get me the gifts I want anyway. So, so I have to go back and find those catalogs, but I'm pretty sure anything she gets, she'll be excited for, but but we spend a lot of the season anticipating something that we're waiting for. And we do that a lot through various things that helps us in our anticipation. You know, we, we set up the lights because that helps sets the mood. And we're looking forward to when family comes. Or maybe we're not looking forward to when family comes. But at least it's on the calendar and we know that day is coming. You know, we look forward to this time of year when we can pull out that one special recipe that you only do at Christmas time. Like, the only time of the year that we ever do a white chocolate raspberry cheesecake is at Christmas, and I'm pretty excited about it. So, uh, you know, we look forward to the certain songs that we sing every year at this time. And it's not Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. So sick of that song. Um, my favorite one, the one that I look forward to, is White Hart's version of Little Drummer Boy. So it's the one version of Little Drummer Boy that has more guitar in it than drums. But, but I digress. Um, you know, we do, we look forward to something. We look forward to the celebration and of course, the idea of Advent is that we are looking forward to Jesus, right? And this anticipation, this hopefulness, and if there was an Advent theme that we were kind of attaching this to today, it would be the idea of hope. But that anticipation, that hope is only satisfied when the thing that you're waiting for is finally fulfilled, it's finally reached, it's finally achieved. And in Christmas, that anticipation, that hope is fulfilled by the birth of Jesus, that God is with us. And we see God's faithfulness in this, and that this is what he had promised from the very, very beginning. So today, we are going to look at sort of what we've just called, we're calling a little two-part series for Christmas of that God is faithful. Um, and 
Last week, Pastor Van talked about the angel's visit to Zacharias and to Mary and, and, and how we saw God's faithful in this. And today we're going to look at two more uh, um, characters in the Bible of where we see God's faithfulness evident in this. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at the stories of Simeon and Anna. Thanks. Now this, admittedly, is not a typical Christmas story. Uh, Typically when we look at the Gospel of Luke and we see the Christmas story in that, we, we think of the gospel of Luke, we, some of us, at least hear Linus in our head as he's, as he's quoting this to Charlie Brown. But often we end the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2 at verse 20 with the shepherds leaving, having been there visiting them in, in the stable, and then them going off and telling everybody what they just saw and heard, and, and then Mary pondering things in her heart. Um, But Luke writes his gospel with a lot of details. And even small episodes in the narrative are written with very specific purposes in mind. Um, And as Van reminded us last week, in Luke chapter 1, this is why Luke wrote this gospel. It says there in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, Since I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So we're looking at this in part even for us today so that we can know the certainty of, of the things that we have been taught. It's not just that these are traditional stories. It's not just that these are things that are there, that are interesting, but they're to help give us certainty, to give us confidence in our faith. So before we jump into chapter 2, starting in verse 21, please pray with me. We'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you that we can come before you this morning in this Christmas season, in this season of of hope, in this season of anticipation. And God, we often talk about not wanting to get caught up in in all the trappings of the season. Um, Because we do know it's so easy for us to do. But there is, there's truth in the fact that some of those trappings, some of those things, those traditions that we have really can help point us to and, and, and focus us on Jesus in this. And so I do pray that today that we would, would have a renewed focus. Um, and that through these narratives of the gospel through this narrative that Luke wrote for us, that we would see your faithfulness uh, and that we would learn to walk in faith and obedience to you. So God, um, speak through my words today. May you be glorified. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. All right, so if you're there in Luke chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 21, uh, just as a, a means of, of context here, the, the very first couple verses of this that is setting the stage for what we're about to look into in the story of, of Simeon and Anna, there are three ceremonies that are mentioned. Uh, the first one is the ceremony of circumcision. Um, I'm not even in Luke chapter 2 yet, so give me a second here while I turn there. Okay, But yeah, the, the first ceremony is that of circumcision. Uh, there in verse 21, it says, On the eighth day, 
when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And so this, this first ceremony that he's talking about there is this one on circumcision. It's there on the, that eighth day, and it probably took place there in, in, the, in the town of Bethlehem. Um, and it's just as, as God had, had directed Abraham back in Genesis, and it was this prescri- excuse me, prescribed in the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 12. And Luke's uh, inclusion of this episode in the life of the baby Jesus, although it's not a very prominent part of the passage there, is in part to, to point to the fact that Mary and Joseph were being faithful followers of the law, that they were not just, just passive participants in this, and clearly you see that from the earlier passages there in Luke, uh, as it is described of the character of, of Mary. Um, and then if you read in Matthew, the, the character of, of Joseph. Um, but, but it's there to, to point out to the fact that, that Mary and Joseph are being faithful and obedient to follow the law that's prescribed. And Luke also puts this in here, I think, a little bit too... Because uh, it sort of parallels the narrative of Zacharias and Elizabeth and John back in chapter 1, where it talks about uh, them going to the temple uh, on the eighth day for John's circumcision. And that's when John was given his name, officially given his name. If you remember from, that, from last week, where... Zacharias is mute. He's not able to talk because of his disbelief uh, at the announcement that the baby was going to be born. And then there at the circumcision, he asks for a tablet and he writes down that the baby's name will be John. Uh, and then he's from that point on, he's able to speak. And so there's, there's parallels between that first part and then here and, and talking about Jesus as well. But it's the time that they're, they're both officially given their name. And, and again, and it, then it also goes to show that, that Mary is being obedient and doing what, that, what the law requires of her. So there's the circumcision is the, the first ceremony in it. But then the second ceremony in it is the purification of, of Mary from childbirth. And that's in verses 22 through 24. And this was done 40 days after the birth of the son. And according to the law, that would be 80 days after the birth of a girl. But there's a 33-day gap between verse 21 and verse 22. And again, the Mosaic law in Leviticus 12 talks about what is required for this purification ceremony. Leviticus 12, 6 through 8 says, When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, She, the mother, is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonial clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. So that's sort of the backdrop to it. And then if you read here in verses 22 through 24, it says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So this was done at the temple in Jerusalem, which is about six miles north of Bethlehem. And it's probably done or is done as they were actually heading back on their hundred mile long journey back up to Nazareth. 
Now Luke, as he writes here in, in this scene, doesn't mention that the law required a lamb. Only that offering a pair of doves was keeping with the law. So Luke is clearly indicating here that, that they fell into the, the poorer category, that they couldn't afford the lamb, and so they had to bring the, the two doves to do it. And it also indicates to me that this was before the time that the wise men or the magi uh, had, would have come to visit them. Because uh, certainly if, if they had already received the gifts of frankincense and gold and myrrh, uh, Mary would have been able to afford a lamb for the offering. Um, so you see in this, in Luke's attention to detail in it, that not only is he making the connections between what is required of the law and how they faithfully obeyed it, but he's putting in the details in here so you can see almost in, in a time frame uh, of some of those details that we've kind of assumed and, and kind of melded together in our Christmas story. So you have the, the circumcision, you have the purification of Mary, and then the third ceremony as well shows the obedience of Mary and Joseph to fulfill the requirements of law, and that was the presentation or the consecration of the firstborn child. According to Numbers chapter 18, back in the Old Testament, uh, this was in recognition that the firstborn son belonged to the Lord. The presentation of this, the, this child never happened before 31 days after birth. So the presentation of the child and the purification of the mother were often done at the same time at the temple. The parents would present their firstborn son to the priest, dedicating him to God's service. And this was a reminder of the redemption uh, from slavery in Egypt and the, the whole Passover story. Uh, how they were avoiding the, the penalty of the last of the ten plagues. Um, that penalty was the death of the firstborn son unless their doorposts were covered with blood. So they would present this child, dedicate him to the Lord, saying that this child belongs to the Lord, but then the parents would redeem him or buy this child back for payment. And that payment was, according to numbers, uh, five sanctuary shekels, roughly about $50 or so. And in return for this, God accepted instead the Levites, the son of Levi, for service in the temple. So the Levites were the only tribe that had people who actually served in the temple. Unless a family completely gave their child over to the Lord. And another thing to note in, in this thing, that Luke doesn't mention that Mary and Joseph redeemed him back. Now, it could be that it's because they were too poor to do it. But it's probably more so the fact that after all that they had heard, all they had been through, all that the angel told them, that they knew that their child, Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would be fully dedicated to the Lord. So when they came to dedicate him and to present him, to consecrate him, they were acknowledging that this child fully belonged to God. And that he himself actually is God. So these three ceremonies here set the stage for what's about to happen there in the temple. And what we're about to see is the Psalm of Simeon and the announcement of Anna. So the Psalm of Simeon there in verses 25 through 23. I found these pictures. These are Rembrandt pictures. So... Uh, painted in the 1600s. It was interesting to, to note when I saw this that, you know, Rembrandt painted a lot of different things. But he did three different paintings of 
the Psalm of Simeon, which just a few verses here in the Bible. The only other stories that he did more of were of Christ and the cross and Samson, which, I don't know, Samson just seems like a pretty intriguing story to me, but you, you put, of all the works that Rembrandt ever did, you have Christ, Samson, and then the Psalm of Simeon. Um, not that it has any real value to what I was going to say, but I just thought that was interesting that this one small scene in the Bible is something that struck a chord with this, this famous Dutch painter. But, so let's look at the Psalm of Simeon. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, and Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. We'll stop there for a second. Now, we don't know much about this man, Simeon, only what's recorded here in these few verses. It certainly appears that he's an Israelite. But we don't know what tribe he's from or what city he comes from. We don't know anything about his family. We don't know if he was married. We don't know if he had any children of his own. We don't really know about his job. Some people have speculated that he was a a priest himself because of the way that he praises God, the way that he seems to know his scriptures, and the way that he blesses the family. But it's really not clear that he is. In fact, it doesn't appear that he actually is a priest because the Holy Spirit had to direct him to go to the temple. Most likely, a priest would have already been at the temple. The only thing we really know about Simeon are those things that seem to matter most to God. We know that Simeon was righteous and devout. He was committed to the Lord and that he lived a life of integrity with a right heart. But more importantly, the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him. So that you saw that he was a man of faith and anticipation. And it says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's not a term that many of us are familiar with. Not a term that many of us have really ever heard of other than in this little passage here. But this term was basically a summary, if you will, of God's promises concerning the restoration of Israel through the coming of the Messiah. If you read back in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, and if you're familiar with Handel's Messiah, this is one of those songs in Handel's Messiah. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is the consolation of Israel, that the one who is coming was going to bring comfort. That he was going to bring forgiveness of sins. That's why I think the line in O Little Town of Bethlehem, which we sing so easily, but we don't often think about the words, is that the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It's the acknowledgement that what was true then 
of them waiting for the Messiah, that that was all wrapped up in their hopes and their fears. And for some of them, it might have been just the fears of the political rulers or the, the fears of uncertainty for their own national identity. But there was also the hopes of knowing that their sins were going to be taken care of and forgiven. The hopes that, that they as the people would have their God to be there with them and comforting them. And so he was waiting for this. This was He was anticipating the Messiah coming. And finally, what we know about Simeon, in addition to him being righteous and devout and waiting for the, the Messiah, is that he was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. That he wouldn't die until he saw God's anointed one, the Messiah. It was also the Holy Spirit who directed him to go to the temple on this particular day, at that particular time, to see Jesus and his parents who brought him there to be presented to the Lord. Those are some pretty cool things to know about this man. If, any, if anybody knew anything about you, I would hope it would be that they would know that you were men and women who were righteous and devoted to the Lord. That, that you would be people who trusted in the Messiah now that he has already come. And that we are people who are, are full of the Holy Spirit. What better things can be said of us than that? So here he is on this scene, and then he sings or presents or quotes this psalm. Verse 28 through 32. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He's echoing back again to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. It says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Again, handles Messiah. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He's also echoing back to uh, Isaiah 52, verse 10, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You know, in verse 30 there, if you look where it says, My eyes have seen your salvation. You know, in Hebrew, it's the word Yeshua. It's salvation. I think there's definitely a little bit of wordplay in there where he's talking about the, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. He's talking about Jesus there. And the focus there of his, of his worship is not just for himself or for the nation of Israel specifically, but he kind of has the focus toward the nations as well. That he's a light to the Gentiles. Compare that to Isaiah 42, 6. And the glory for the people of Israel. That's Isaiah 46, 13. It says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people. As a light to the nations to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from dungeons and to those who dwell in darkness from prison. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Even though Simeon here is a righteous and devout Jew, he did not view the Messiah's coming as a benefit only for him. Or for the nation of Israel. This Messiah for sure was Israel's king. 
who would sit on the throne of David. The Messiah was certainly Israel's glory, as they understood it. But the Messiah, Jesus, is also a light of revelation to the Gentiles. So what Simeon is, is praising God for in this is something for us. We are those Gentiles. We are those recipients of what Simeon is recognizing there. That this baby that was to come, who was the promised king of Israel, right? That, that was what the, the wise men came to worship, was that king of Israel. But not only is that, but he is the light for you and me. This isn't just a baby for a time long ago for people back then. But this was the Savior for all of us. And I don't, can't help but think about how we just finished off a study in Ephesians where we talked about the, one of the mysteries of the gospel, the fact that it was not just for the nation of Israel. I mean, this is what Paul was talking about, that it wasn't just for Israel, but the mystery of the gospel is that you and I are included in this. What an amazing thing it is that as a part of God's plan and story from all the way from the beginning, even though he had chosen people to, to kind of tell his story through, but that story wasn't just for those people. That story was for everyone, for you and me. 2,000 years later, even. Simeon's psalm also is reflective of Isaiah 49, verse 6, where it says, I will make you a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. What a great inclusion that we have in this story. Well, after he, he does this psalm of praise, verse, 20, well, verse 33 through 35 says, And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. I can just imagine Joseph and Mary are just, you know, doing their faithful bit of obedience, taking the child to the temple to, to dedicate him to the Lord. And all of a sudden this this strange man comes up to him, you know. I don't know, David and Allie, if you've had this yet where you're walking through a store or something and some stranger comes up to you, oh, what a cute little baby. Can I, can I hold him? I always hated that when people did that to our kids. Like, no, you can't hold my baby. Although there were, there were times, sorry, Darcy, when she was younger, her first four months of life, she didn't like it when I held her. She just, anytime I tried to hold her, she'd scream. So if anybody ever wanted to hold her, I was very quick to hand her off. I would not trade her for the world right now, but, um, those first four months. But they take this baby, they take Jesus to the temple and dedicate him, and all of a sudden this stranger, this man comes up to him and, and starts singing these praises to God about him. Of course, they knew this already. They'd already heard the angels tell this to him. They'd already had the experience of the shepherds coming into the, into the stable to worship him. So, you know, weird things have already been happening. But then somebody comes and sings this praise to God about their baby. And they're probably sitting there with their jaw dropped up like, I didn't expect this today. I mean, eight days ago was weird enough as it was with all these, you know, people coming into our our glamorous stable. But now, here we are at the temple. thought we are going to start a little bit of normalcy. So Simeon turns and he blesses them. But then he turns to Mary and and I don't know. I kind of call this sort of the, the Paul Harvey moment in the story, where he kind of tells the rest of the story. Because up to this point, everything has been pretty good. You know, like, 
your son, this Savior, he's going he's gonna to save the world. But then he kind of lets them know that there's more to this story. Because as much as the Old Testament predicts that the Messiah was coming, the Old Testament also prophesied that the Messiah would be rejected and crucified and that he would suffer a, a, a death of a, a suffering servant. Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 uh, talk about the cost that the Messiah would need to pay to be a substitution for the sin of mankind. And so Simeon blesses them and he says to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce through your own soul too. So Simeon says that the Messiah will reveal the hearts of men. He will reveal the, the wicked and the evilness that we all have within us. And that on the account of Jesus, that some will rise and some will fall. His words warn Mary for the grief that she must suffer as the rejection of her son by men will cause her to witness the death of him on the cross. Truly, this is a sore that is going to pierce your soul. But Simeon's saying in this that, that as Jesus, as much as he's a savior, he's a divider as well. That we really can't look at Jesus and not make a choice to either accept him for who he is and what he's done, or to reject him. It makes me think of is it 2 Corinthians 2, I believe, where it says that to some that we are the smell of life, and to others we are the smell of death. That we, as Christians, we have a stench about us. And for some of us, to the people that we come across, that stench is a good stench because we are drawing people to Christ. I know stench and goodness don't often go together, but take it this time. It. But to others, we are a stench that, like, yeah, that's Christ. And I don't want anything to do with it. They, they're running after their own sin, and they don't want what is a good smell to be associated with them. But think about God's faithfulness in this. That in this, this story, this example of, of Simeon here, we see God's faithfulness in that God, first of all, keeps his promises to him. He says that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ, until he saw the Messiah. That God is faithful to allowing Simeon to actually see the Messiah. What a promise that would be if we knew that, that there was something that, that God had said to us that we would be able to see or to do in our lifetime. And then that actually would happen. And we see God's faithfulness that he, he keeps his promise. We see God's faithfulness and the fact that not only is he keeping the promise of Simeon, but he's keeping the promises of the Old Testament that the Messiah would actually come. And that all those prophecies had, that had been made hundreds of years before actually have finally come true. I mean, you think about that, the Old Testament closed... The last we heard from God through the prophets in the Old Testament was 400 years prior to this. 
The prophecies in Isaiah were somewhere around 650 or so, 670 to early 700s B.C. So yeah, about 700 years since Isaiah's prophecies. And I don't know how many thousands of years since the beginning of Genesis, where in Genesis 3.15 we, we see that God from the very beginning after the fall promises that from the seed of the woman one would be raised up that would crush the head of the serpent that would crush Satan so that we could be freed from our sin God keeps his promises God is faithful And do we see that today? Do we still trust God in it for his promises? Do we still look at God as a faithful God in the here and now? Or are we the type of people that after time have given up? That we, in a sense, kind of hold to the promises of, well, that, yeah, that'll all happen. It'll all, you know, Turn out well in the end. But, I don't know. God's not that faithful to me here and and now. God is faithful. When you see that there with Simeon. But then right after this, this little scene, there's another scene, and it's the announcement of Anna. Um, Which... Just a few verses here, three verses of this. But it, it too goes to show the faithfulness of God in this. So there was a prophet or prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. And coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Now, unlike Simeon, we know a bit more about Anna. We know about her family. We know her dad's name. We know what tribe she comes from, tribe of Asher, which we can go into a lot more uh, conversation and detail about that, but I'm just going to leave it for sake of time that we know that she's from the tribe of Asher. We know approximately her age, and, and depending on how you understand the Greek, and that, that you can say that she was 84 or that she was a widow for 84 years, but we know that she's at least 84 years old. We certainly know her marriage status, that she's been a widow for a long time. She was only married for seven years. And if she's like, you know, what we tend to understand Mary, if we say that Mary might have been between the age of 15 and 20, that means Anna might have been widowed as young as the age of 22. Or maybe 27. So she had been a widow for 60 some years. We know her job, that she was a prophetess, that she was telling other people about God, speaking truth about God to other people. We know her character. As a woman who continually worshipped the Lord. A woman who fasted and prayed continually. It's not clear if she came to the temple soon after she became a widow. Or if that happened more in her later years of life that she was there all the time. Luke doesn't tell us specifically what she was fasting and praying for. But it is clear that she, too, was looking for the coming Messiah. And so what Simeon had to have the Holy Spirit do 
to prompt him to go into the temple, Anna was already there because that's where she spent her time, worshiping God. And thus she just happened to kind of come onto the scene of Mary and Joseph and Jesus and Simeon. So she's there at that exact moment as Simeon, Simeon is publicly identifying the baby Jesus as God's Messiah. And although we know more about her, we are told less about what she actually said. No, obviously Luke was writing, giving specific details, but rather than giving the details about what she said, he talks about her encounter with Jesus in a little bit more generic or general terms, and that she was full of thanksgiving. And that she told other people. So that she was thankful and evangelistic. The fact that she was already known as a prophetess, as somebody who was speaking the truths about God to others, probably gives her testimony to those in Jerusalem and those in the temple a little bit more weight to more of an impact that they would know and understand and believe what she's talking about. But think about how long that she had been waiting to hear this good news of great joy. Here she was, an old woman, a widow. Even as, as Greg alluded to with the, the idea of the, the shepherds being probably insignificant people. That oftentimes that we, in our, even in our own body, in our own community today, forget about those who have lost their husbands. We forget about what they might be going through. And, and certainly in a, in a time of year like this, that's something that we as a body believers should never be doing. But, but here's this woman who's older, a widow for a long time, on the margins of society, and she's looking to the Lord. She's worshiping the Lord. Anna here is an example to us as we age that we still have a role to play. That in our grief, we still have a role to play. That God is not done with you yet. That you are not forgotten. And the Lord's promises are for you too. And that you too can be a blessing to those around us. Because we need to hear what God has spoken to you. So that we can see God as well. Here, he is. Here she is, this woman who has not given up on the Lord. For all those years of being a widow is trusting the Lord, looking for the Messiah. And God was faithful in this to keep his promise as well. You know, I will go back and say something real quick about her being from the tribe of Asher. This is a freebie. I don't take it for what it's worth because I don't know. It's interesting to me. This, again, you probably not going to find this in any real theology book or anything, but Asher, he was the eighth son of Jacob. So if you remember, you know, all the 12 tribes that came from Jacob. Now, all of the moms with Jacob, that's all a whole convoluted story too, but but Asher, when he was born, his mom said, 
now that I have another son, all the women will call me happy, will call me blessed. That's what the name Asher means. I just think that's, I don't know, intriguing. I think it's more than just coincidence. But I don't know. Maybe this is why Luke puts it in here. What was Mary called? Because she was going to give birth to the Messiah. That she would be called blessed. And I just, the, 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 the parallels there are, are, I don't know, they're interesting to me. That here this Anna comes from this, this tribe, this family name of will be called blessed. And yet Mary, she's actually meeting the one who is called blessed because of having the Messiah. That's, I don't know. Again, I don't know if you'll ever see that in any other theology book, but I just, I thought that was interesting. Um, okay. Let me close with this. We're talking about God's faithfulness here in the Christmas story. That in, in all of this, there is anticipation. There's hope that we have. And that hope, is only fulfilled when we receive it, right? And here we are, on this side of the story, we have the Messiah with us. We have Jesus. We have all that had been waiting for, and we've seen the entire story, and we can put it back together, we can piece it together. We can understand it, because we have God's word there. But what are we doing with that? How are we responding to that? Are we men and women who are living in obedience to God's will for our life? Or are we, you know, just sort of at this point where we're just on cruise control? We're just kind of phoning it in. Like, you know, I'm saved. I know Jesus loves me. I know my sins are forgiven. So I don't need to do that all God has called me to do. I mean, there's grace there, right? I mean, Mary and Joseph probably could, that, could have done that. You know, they had all these promises. They knew who Jesus was. They knew that he was God. They probably didn't have to go through all the ritual and ceremony, right? They knew that their child, that was salvation. It wasn't the ritual or ceremony that was salvation. It was Jesus, right? So they could have just kind of put it on cruise control. But no, they, were, they continued to be faithful to do all that God had commanded them to do in the law. Now, certainly we're not commanded to do all those things in the Old, in the Old Testament law. But on this side of the cross, God has called us to live holy and righteous lives. He has called us to forgive others. He has called us to tell others about his son. He has called us to live in obedience to him. So are we doing that? Do we eagerly anticipate God to work? I mean, these people were waiting for a long time. For Anna, it was an entire lifetime, practically. For the nation of Israel, it was hundreds of years since they heard the, the prophecies first given. For all of mankind, it was from the beginning of time nearly that, that we'd been waiting for Messiah. Do we anticipate God's work or do we give up? Like, it's just been too long. I've been praying for something for a week now and God hasn't answered it. So I'm, I'm just going to stop praying. I've been praying for 10 years and God hasn't answered my prayer for that loved one to come to Christ. Or I've been living next door to these goober of people for however long and they're not changing. So I'm just going to give up and I'm just going to, you know. Or do we trust that God is going to be a God who works and does things? Not on our time scale, but on his time scale. And lastly, do we recognize Jesus when we see him? 
Now, Simeon, when he saw Jesus, he knew who he was right away. When Anna came upon them in the temple, recognized who he was. Now, we may not see Jesus physically, but we see God every time we open up the pages of this book. Do we recognize that this book is God's word to us? Or do we just take it as some good moral stories? Do we see Jesus when we encounter our brothers and sisters here who are loving on us or challenging us, encouraging us, convicting us to live the way that God has called us to? Do we recognize Jesus in that we are called to obey even when it's difficult? And that's how we even represent Jesus to this world, is by living for him. See, God is faithful in all these things. This event that had been in anticipation for hundreds of Thousands of years came true at the birth of Jesus. And God was faithful, and he's faithful today. And that's what, why we come together, and that's why we celebrate Christmas. It's because God has kept his word throughout history for you and for me. So, Father, thank you that you love us that you did send your son, and that we have examples of people in your word who trusted you for entire lifetimes to see you work. And I pray that we would not give up on you, that we would continually walk forward in faithful anticipation, not just to remember what you've done, but trusting you for what you're going to do. Thank you for this this Christmas season. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.